Stephanie Feldstein is the Population and Sustainability Director at the Center for Biological Diversity, where she heads a national program that addresses the connection between human population growth, overconsumption, and the wildlife extinction crisis. She created the innovative Take Extinction Off Your Plate campaign, and her work has been featured on the Huffington Post, NPR, Salon, The Guardian, The Washington Post, and more. She is the author of The Animal Lover's Guide to Changing the World, Practical Advice and Everyday Actions for a More Sustainable, Humane, and Compassionate Planet. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you all for being here. Um, I don't have any free samples in here for you, but I do have a lot of cute animal photos, so hopefully that will help a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk a bit today, as the introduction and the description implies, about how agriculture affects wildlife, why earth-friendly diets matter, and what you can do to help save wildlife and fight climate change, whether you're a longtime vegan or if this veg fest is really your first taste of vegan eating. But first, a little bit about me and why I'm up here. So I've been a lifetime animal lover. And I first became vegan when I was about 16 years old. And back then there wasn't social media. So we didn't have as much access to really understand as much about where, uh, what happened to put food on our plate, where it really came from, how animals were treated. And I found that out when I picked up a battered copy of Peter Singer at a used book sale, which I think is kind of a common story among a lot of vegetarians and vegans. Um, and when I learned about that, I, I immediately stopped eating meat at that point. But also back then, not only was there not as much access to information, there wasn't as much access to food options. So oftentimes this was my meal, the old standby of fries and salad. And I mean, I like fries and salad as much as the next person, but that's not, that doesn't really make it for a sustainable diet, for something that someone can stick with and, and get really excited about. And I think there are a lot of us who have been through this, and there are a lot of people who are still going through this. We're very lucky here in Portland and at this veg fest, but you know, in the middle of the country, this is still what a lot of people are left ordering. So, you know, both for 16 year old me who wanted to know so much more about how my actions were affecting animals, and also for 16 year old me who wanted a few more options of what I could eat if I wanted to eat ethically, um, that's really why I wrote The Animal Lover's Guide to Saving the World, which, um, which just came out this year. And the other piece of this is that it also helps make the connection between all of the different animals that our lives impact. And that really ties into the other part of my life, which is my work for the Center for Biological Diversity. If you're not familiar with the center, we're a national wildlife organization. We're actually based in Tucson, Arizona, but we have offices all over the, the country, including several staff here in Portland. And we use a combination of advocacy, creative media, science, and the law to fight to protect endangered species. And we're pretty good at it. Over the years, we've protected more than 500 endangered species. We've also protected more than 450 million acres of critical habitat. That's five times the entire national park system. It's also larger than the combined area of California, Florida, and Texas. And the reason that we do this is because you can give endangered species all the protections in the world, but if they don't have a place to live, it's not going to help. And as impressive as this is though, it's not enough because habitat is still being taken away from wildlife. And one of the biggest threats is agriculture. It takes a lot of land to grow food. And animal agriculture requires far more resources than any other type of agriculture. And that winds up having a negative impact on wildlife from bears. These grizzly bears were driven from their native habitat due to agricultural expansion, largely for feed crops and grazing land. And butterflies, monarch butterflies used to be an iconic part of summertime throughout the United States. But now because the middle of the country has been taken over by vast swaths of GMO monocrops, largely to feed um, cattle, pigs, and chickens, those cr crops are being drenched with pesticides that are wiping out the monarch caterpillar's sole source of food. So their populations have plummeted by about 90% in recent years. So in short, Animal agriculture, it's essentially eating the planet. And it's the single most environmentally destructive industry that's out there. And the reason why is because no matter what metric you look at of environmental destruction, animal agriculture 
is at or near the top of the list as one of the leading causes. And I'm going to talk a bit more about a few of these. So first, climate change. I promised cute animal pictures. I like that little guy. Um, <laughs> so animal agriculture is responsible for at least 14.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. That makes it one of the leading causes more than trains, planes, and automobiles put together. About one in six species is threatened by climate change. Um, so it's not just polar bears, it affects tons of ocean species, species really throughout all habitats that are not only losing, uh, losing their homes to uh, weather-related changes and disasters, but you know, also who are losing food sources. It's all connected and climate change is having a ripple effect um, throughout the ecosystems. And it's, there have been a number of studies that have shown that plant-based plant eating is a necessary part of fighting the climate crisis. And then there's water pollution. In case you've never been on a farm, pigs, cows, and chickens create a lot of manure. And typically where that manure goes on factory farms is into these manure lagoons, which are basically these giant open pits of manure. And they're not very well regulated, oftentimes not very well maintained. Um, we see, like with the hurricanes out east, that when there's flooding, that often means there's flooding of these manure lagoons. And when they get full, usually what they do about it is that they take the manure and they spray it on surrounding crops as fertilizer, which is as gross as it sounds, especially if you live in the area. Many of the communities around these farms are low income or communities of color, and they have a lot of public health problems. They can't open their windows. They can't go outside. It's pretty disgusting. But also what that manure does is it winds up running off into our water systems. And there have been more than 100,000 miles of rivers in the United States that have been polluted by animal agriculture. And also millions of acres of ponds and reservoirs, as well as bays and estuaries. You name the water system. It's been contaminated by animal agriculture which means that it affects a lot of freshwater species, from fish to amphibians to you know, salamanders and lizards, as well as the birds that use these waterways when they're migrating and that feed on the animals um, within those waterways. And then there's habitat loss. About half of the landmass of the lower 48 United States is being used for animal agriculture. That's a huge amount of space, and worldwide it's about a third of the planet is being used for animal agriculture. And so, of course, you know, we've heard quite a bit over the years, there's been a lot of attention on the deforestation in the Amazon, one of the most biodiverse, rich places in the world. And it's lost about 70% of, um, of its ecosystem to animal agriculture. But here in the United States, we've had these amazing biodiverse, rich uh, grasslands in the middle of the country that have been largely lost, again, to, grow, uh, to growing feed crops primarily for livestock. But it's not just habitat loss in what's being directly taken over. There's also this problem of grazing. And this is something in particular that I like to talk about when talking about sustainable food, because there's a lot of conversation out there that's saying grass-fed beef will solve all of our problems. At the Center for Biological Diversity, we like to call it habitat-fed beef, because the reality is, is that cows aren't being left to graze in area that's areas that aren't being used for anything else. There are a lot of other species that live in those areas where cows go to graze. And it creates a number of conflicts. One of them is that there are species like buffalo um, that are being driven out of their native lands. They're actually being blocked out to reserve some of that area for cattle. We also see other kinds of competition as well. Um, competition is also relevant to the bison. Some of you may have heard that you know, every year they're, um, they, they call some of the herds of bison that come out of Yellowstone National Park. And the reason that they do it, this is kind of twisted. They say that they need to kill the bison that come out because those bison carry a disease that cattle could get. The problem is though, that in reality, there's never been a documented case of cattle getting that disease from bison, but the only reason that bison carry that disease is because it was introduced to them by cattle. So, and that's pretty typical, and I'll give a few other examples as well, that when it comes up against wildlife versus the meat and dairy industry, wildlife tends to lose. And this um, is another example of competition. This is a sage grouse, 
And sage grouse require tall grasslands for protection from predators. But when cattle are allowed to come in and graze that grass down, these guys become vulnerable. And on the public lands in the United States, there are more than 175 already threatened or endangered species that are further threatened by the presence of grazing cattle. And so that's why, you know, when we talk about grass-fed beef, when you hear people talking about that, it's not really this, this silver bullet solution. It comes with a lot of issues, especially as we look at, you know, as people look at, well, if we're going to scale up and have a lot more grass-fed beef, a lot more grazing cattle, it's going to cause a lot more problems for wildlife. And another uh, thing that often comes into play is wildlife services. If you're not familiar with wildlife services, it's a fairly secretive arm of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And the service that they provide is that they get rid of animals that are considered pests by industry, um, largely the animal agriculture industry. And I mean get rid of in a mafia kind of way. They use very, very cruel methods, um, traps and poisons to, to kill off animals. And they kill off about as many as 3 million native animals a year. There are also a lot more non-native species, as well as dogs and cats that often become victim to this. And, um, oh. um, and it's not just some of the species that you might affect, that you might expect that are these kind of direct predators like coyotes, wolves, bears, bobcats. They also kill off tens of thousands of prairie dogs every year. Because prairie dogs dig burrows, which are considered a hazard because a grazing cow might walk along and stick a hoof in it, break a leg, and become a loss to the rancher. And to show how far it goes, the USDA also kills off grasshoppers for eating grass because they want to save that grass for cattle. So that, that again gets to the point that wildlife tend to lose in this equation. And so you know, one of the things that you know, I'll talk a little bit more about is that when you choose to eat more plant-based foods, you're choosing, these are some of the practices that you are actively choosing not to support with your wallet and with your diet. And so what about fish? I know I've been talking a lot about agriculture that happens on land, but basically almost everything I said also applies to fish. Um, fish farms are basically wet factory farms. You have a lot of the same problems with high chemical use and runoff, as well as overcrowding, the concern from the uh, animal welfare side of things. And one thing that's often not talked about when people are touting fish farms is that the fish have to be fed from somewhere, right? So that means that they're either being fed smaller fish that are being wild caught, or they're being fed feed crops that, again, run into a lot of the same habitat and water pollution problems that, that I was talking about earlier. Um, the other thing when it comes to wild caught fish is uh, fisheries around the world have been overfished. And we see this especially with these, these larger species, these, uh, these predator species, who are key to ocean ecosystems. Um, species like the bluefin tuna, who have been sometimes nicknamed the wolves of the sea. They're, they're these amazingly fast predators. And they've been fished down to about, they've lost about 97% of their population compared to pre-fish levels. Um, and we also see in the Caribbean, we've seen the loss of sharks and other predators there um, at levels about 90% from, from what should be there. And the other thing to note um, that's the, the negative side of fishing is there's also this bycatch problem. And bycatch basically means um, it's the collateral damage of the fishing industry. They lay out these massive nets and fishing gear that can literally stretch miles, and it just kind of sweeps up everything. But they don't want everything. They only want whatever species of fish they can sell, the ones that are most popular on menus. And so we wind up seeing um, lots of sea turtles, as well as dolphins, porpoises, whales, seabirds, tons of animals that are just caught up in these, not to mention all of the other fish species that are just the non-targeted non species. In the United States, there's about 2 billion pounds of bycatch a year. And we actually have some laws that try to regulate this. So there are a lot of fisheries around the world that have no laws or very poor laws to regulate bycatch. And in the US, we're still importing the vast majority of our seafood. So a lot of it is coming from these fisheries that have even worse records than this. So it's no wonder that sea turtle looks kind of grumpy. And so clearly, animal agriculture has a massive impact on the planet. But I want to give one more example to show just kind of like how big this is. And sometimes, you know, we measure the comparison between species in terms of biomass. So if we were to put all of the humans on one side of the scale 
we'd weigh in at about 125 million metric tons. But you can't just count us when we're looking at our impact on the planet. We have to count all of the animals that we raise for food because we bring them with us everywhere we go and they wouldn't be there if it weren't for us. So if we were to add, to add all the cattle on, that would add another 170 million metric tons of cattle and add on all the other species that are raised for food. And you'd have about 300 million metric tons of domesticated farmed animals and 125 million metric tons of humans. Now, what if we were to put all of the land vertebrate animals on a scale as well, everything from you know mice and shrews up to elephants, they would only weigh in at about 10 million metric tons. That's about half of just the number of chickens that are being raised for food. So our appetite for meat on this planet is literally crowding out wildlife. Now, of course, you might ask, doesn't everything that we grow require resources? Of course it does. Fruits and vegetables and legumes, all the plant-based foods also require land and food, land and water and energy to grow. But the numbers are far less. A professor at UCLA did a breakdown of a popular food, um, and she looked at bean burritos compared to beef burritos. And just in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, the bean burrito was only about one-tenth of what the beef burrito costs to the climate. And the University of Michigan recently evaluated the Beyond Burger and found even greater savings by going with a plant-based burger over a beef burger. So 99% less water for the plant-based burger, 93% less land, 90% fewer emissions again, and 46% less energy. And so, as you can see, choosing the plant-based burger can make a huge difference across all of those different metrics that we talked about, which translates into saving those resources for wildlife. And it's not just beef. Um, beef is the worst offender. Uh, cows, because of their digestive systems, have a greater impact on the climate compared to chickens and pigs. But chickens and pigs also have way more of an impact on the climate than beans do. And they also produce manure, which beans do not produce. <laughs> so there are a number of different, uh, you know, a number of different reasons. Again, no matter which scale you use, you will find that almost every single time that the plant-based foods will be better for the environment and wildlife than any of the animal-based foods. And I'm happy to, you know, revisit any of this and take other questions at um, at the end as well. There'll be plenty of time for that. Um, so the question is. Why does this matter? We're standing here at the Veg Fest. We all love vegetables, don't we? Um, and hopefully that's true. But you know, you never know. There are maybe you know a number of vegans in this room. There may be you know again a number of people who you know are just trying out plant-based eating. But there are a number of reasons why it's really important that you know that we share this information about the impact of animal agriculture on wildlife and the climate. The first one is that we are in the middle of the sixth mass extinction crisis. Wildlife are going extinct at the fastest rate since the time of the dinosaurs. And if you think about how much our lives and the health of the planet that we need as well depends on healthy ecosystems, that's pretty scary for us too. It's also pretty astonishing. There was a study that just came out within the past couple weeks that found that um, we are driving mammals extinct at such a devastating rate that it will take nature three to five million years to recover from the damage that we're doing now. And the other reason is climate change. You may have seen that the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change came out with a new report that had some pretty dire warnings in it. They said, pretty frankly, we are in trouble. We are headed toward catastrophic climate change. If we don't get global warming and keep global warming down below 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next 10 to 14 years, then we will have some irreversible and pretty devastating effects across the planet. And, but they did say that it is possible for us to meet that goal, but it's going to take work. And it's going to take work across all sectors. And there's been increasing attention on what that means when it comes to food. And they found that, again, plant-based eating is really a key part of the solution to fighting climate change. There was another study that also just came out um, within just a few days of this report that looked, again, particularly at beef, and said that if we want to meet climate goals, then in countries like the United States, we need to reduce beef consumption by 90%. And so that means replacing it with a lot more of those plant-based burgers and other plant-based foods that are much healthier for us and for the environment. And a, 
A side note on this worried little fish, um, it's a clownfish like Nemo from Finding Nemo. And they're particularly susceptible to climate change, not just because ocean acidification ruins their coral reef homes, but it has this effect on them where they lose their sense of direction. And instead of swimming into the safety of their anemones, they actually swim into the mouths of predators. So that'd be a pretty grim third sequel to Finding Nemo. So what is it that we can do then to take all of this information and, and fight climate change and save wildlife? The first, of course, is to choose sustainably. Is that at every meal, you have the choice of what you're going to put on your plate and what kind of impact that's going to have on the planet. And so at every meal, you can choose how that's going to affect your carbon footprint. Um, there have been a number of researchers who have looked at, you know, as, as individuals and the things that we can do to help fight climate change in our daily lives. And they've looked at all the different choices that you can make. And in every single study, this is usually within the top three is eating a plant-based diet. The second thing that you can do is to encourage others to eat more plant-based foods. And now, nobody wants to have a big, you know, conversion lecture. It's not about that, but it's about meeting people where they are. It's about sharing information, but also, and sometimes more importantly, is sharing food. Share the foods that you love with people who aren't already eating plant-based diets. Um, you know, take them out to your favorite restaurants, cook for them, have a potluck, share recipes. And also, encourage them wherever they're starting. Because sometimes it can be, you know, it can be easy to forget that, you know, we're all that person, like where I was before I became vegetarian at 16. And at that point, like I never could have seen myself giving up meat or eventually giving up dairy. Um, but, you know, and it, we're, the way that we eat is very much ingrained into, you know, the, the people we hang out with. It's ingrained into our social structures. It's ingrained into our culture. And so it's important to, you know, be patient and be tolerant and understanding and encourage people, whether they're just trying that, you know, almond milk latte for the first time or whether they're thinking that, you know, they want to make a complete switch to veganism. And an important part of making of encouraging others is making sure that there are options for them that when you take people out for a vegan meal that they're not just stuck with the salad and fries and so that means asking for more options and this is really important because this makes vegan eating more accessible for everybody and this involves if you have kids in school talk to the school board and talk to the administrators about adding more plant-based options into the cafeteria, whether that's starting with adopting Meatless Monday or having plant-based options every day for kids. It can be sometimes challenging with schools. There are a lot of regulations through the USDA around school meals, but it is possible. They need to hear from people, though, that you're interested. Asking for more options also means asking for more options everywhere you go. We're really lucky here in Portland. We have a ton of all vegan restaurants. And as somebody who grew up and spent most of my life in the Midwest before moving out here, it's still pretty amazing to see a culture in Portland where people go out to a vegan restaurant and they don't identify as vegan at all. You don't see that in places like the Midwest typically. But so that's why it's really important to have plant-based options at every single restaurant where people go. Now, I don't advocate for people, you know, spending a lot of their time eating at McDonald's, but the reality is, is that 70 million people a day do. And when those 70 million people go to McDonald's, they're not seeing a single plant-based item. So not only do they not have the choice to eat more sustainably, but they also aren't even getting the message that eating a plant-based meal is an option, that that's a real thing that happens. <laughs> Yes, it has its problems for sure, but everywhere people go, this is how we start shifting it. And there's been a lot of success with this, is as we've seen more options, we've seen this particularly in plant-based dairy alternatives, they've become so normalized at every single coffee shop across the country. And many coffee shops, not even the chain ones, even smaller ones in the middle of the country have multiple different plant-based options for milks. And that's because as it becomes more available, not only does it become more affordable, but again, it becomes you know, an option that makes sense to people who aren't already you know, maybe here in this room with us. And then the other reason this is important and the reason why I was really excited to give this talk here, even though, you know, there may be a number of uh, members of the choir that I'm preaching to on the importance of plant-based eating, is that it's really important that we raise awareness about all of the benefits of plant-based eating. Because as we know, there are 
tons of benefits. It's better for our health. We know that eating plant-based diets um, help reduce risk of disease like heart disease and diabetes and certain kinds of cancer. We know obviously that when you're not eating animals, it's better for those animals themselves. Um, we know that plant-based diets are also better for um, public health and environmental justice because it's really hard, like I was talking about earlier with that manure spraying, it's really hard on, on a lot of communities and as well as on workers. Um, the jobs in the animal agriculture industry are some of the most exploitative and dangerous jobs out there. But despite all of that information being out there, we're still eating way too much meat. Animal agriculture is still driving the extinction crisis. It's still a major factor in climate change. So the more that we are able to raise awareness about all of the different reasons, including the impacts on wildlife and the climate, the more likely we are to be able to reach more people. Now, this isn't just individuals, although it helps there. There may be people out there who you know, maybe don't feel affinity for chickens and pigs, but they love wolves because it reminds them of their dogs. That's great. As much as I would love for everybody to adore all animals as much as I do, that's not necessarily the case. This goes back to meeting people where they are, and so giving them as many reasons as possible. But it also goes for legislators and policymakers too. Now, granted, especially here in the United States, the legislators don't necessarily care as much, you know, that much more about the climate as they do about farmed animals. But we are seeing a shift, particularly internationally. There aren't a whole lot of international laws having to do with animal cruelty, but we are seeing a lot of international talk about climate change and being able to bring concerns about animal agriculture and the need to reduce meat and dairy consumption to those climate talks can go a long way toward really driving international policy. And we also see this at um, you know restaurants and other places providing more options. They don't necessarily care about your health. They just want to sell you whatever it is that you want to eat. But a lot of them are trying to put a better front out there, that they're more sustainable, that they have a lower carbon footprint. And emphasizing the impact of plant-based foods and helping them save greenhouse gas emissions can be a way to create change. And so I just wanted to add a few other things about eating sustainably and what goes into an earth-friendly diet, especially for those in the room who may already be eating a vegan or primarily vegan diet. One of those pieces is choosing organic. Pesticides are devastating. Um, they also feed into that water pollution that, uh, that's killing off freshwater species, from fish to birds to amphibians, and it's also become a major threat to pollinators, to birds, to bees, to bats, to butterflies, you name it. Um, you know, this is another one of the sad ironies, we need pollinators in order to grow our food, but the way that we're growing our food now is killing off pollinators. So it's a cycle that would be best for us to end. Um, organic foods are not always widely available or affordable to everybody, so do what you can. And the more that it, when you are able to choose organic foods and the more you're able to purchase those, that's going to help bring down the price for everybody and also make organic agriculture more accessible to farmers themselves who want to make that transition. And then another huge piece of this is fighting food waste. This number is pretty astonishing because 40% of the food that's produced in the United States is thrown out. It's never eaten. And when you think about all of these resources that we've been talking about that go into producing food, all of the land, all of the water, the pesticides that are used, all of the energy and greenhouse gas emissions, that's also being thrown out when food is tossed. Now, because more resources go into meat and dairy, of course, throwing out any meat and dairy has more of a negative impact than other types of food, but that's actually the smaller percentage. It's mostly fruits and vegetables um, and then baked goods, the perishable items that, that you know, often are sold more cheaply that are being thrown out uh, most frequently. So there are a number of ways that you can fight food waste. Um, you know, one is if you're able to take uh, smaller, more frequent shopping trips. Uh, really pay attention. Do an audit of your refrigerator and what you're eating. Pay attention to what it is you're throwing out and adjust your, your shopping list accordingly. I know there are a lot of us that every time we go to the store, we buy an aspirational bag of salad that just sits there and then rots as we eat all the other things that may seem more interesting at the time. Um, so if that's what you're doing, then, you know, rethink really, are you ever going to eat that salad? If you are, what do you need to, you know, to make that something you'll eat? If not, I like to buy more versatile greens like spinach and kale that I can throw in a lot of different dishes if I'm not going to eat it raw. 
Another thing that you can do um, is to pay attention to how you're storing your food. USDA has a great app, it's called the Food Keeper app, and it has an A to Z list of all the best ways to storage different kinds of, to store different kinds of fruits and vegetables, as long as, you know, kind of what their, um, you know, their expected dates are for how long they last. And speaking of dates, you can ignore expiration dates on food. Except for baby formula, they're not regulated at all. They are literally arbitrary dates that manufacturers come up with of when they think food will be freshest. And of course, if I'm a manufacturer and I want to tell you when food is going to be freshest, it's going to be the shortest time possible so that you throw that out and buy more of my product. So use common sense. Use your senses. Sniff it. Look at it. If it doesn't smell bad, if there's no mold on it, odds are it's perfectly fine to go ahead and eat it. And also, this is another way to, you know, get your friends involved, again, to share a lot of those great vegan recipe ideas, is that if you found that you've overshopped, invite people over for dinner. Again, just do whatever you can to try to use the food that you're buying so that all the resources that went into it aren't being unnecessarily wasted. And then finally, support local and fair food. I know local food gets a lot of buzz, um, and there are benefits to it. One key thing, though, is that Eating no meat and dairy one day a week saves more greenhouse gas emissions than an entirely local diet. So that is still the first and most important thing, is eating a plant-based diet. But once you're already there, shopping local has a lot of benefits. It not only helps support your local economy, but it also typically supports smaller, more diversified farms that are growing regional food. And that's really the future of our food system. Um, that's where we need to go if we're going to have more sustainable food. And then the fair piece is really important too, not just making sure that there are fair working conditions for farm workers, um, but also for servers in restaurants, for people throughout the supply chain of our food system. Because really, sustainable food isn't really going to happen unless it's sustainable not only for wildlife and the planet, but also for the people who are involved, for the communities where our food is grown, and for the animals themselves. And I will wrap it up there. Thank you all for listening, um, and I'm happy to take any questions.